nevertheless, we will go on and try our luck. Um, right. Brought up YouTube. Brought up Facebook. This is day four of the Biolympic trials. Day four of five. All right. Where are your Facebook video? Well, as soon as I can bring up the Facebook video, we will begin. Um, thank you for joining me. I know those of you on YouTube are uh, <laughs> here with me live already. And um, if Facebook doesn't want to work, we'll just have to send everyone to YouTube. All right. Sorry, I know this is not the most fun part of the Biolympic trials. Staring at the side of my head. Um, but let's see. Looks like it may be bouncing back. <laughs> and if so, then we may be able to get started. Um, for those on YouTube, hang in there. Um, here in day four, we really don't have that many new techniques to look at. It's going to be mostly strategy today, which will be really fun because that's where we get into the real nitty gritty of how to practice and, and all of that. All right, well, we'll just see how we can get along. Now, for those of you on Facebook, um, I'm going to put a put something in the comments for you just to let you know that if it's choppy on Facebook, you can always jump over to YouTube. Uh, so let me make that comment to you, and then I will continue. I've heard from a number of you, and I've, I've seen the discussions, which are great and amazing, by the way. Um, it's really inspiring to, to see your journal entries. Again, not that you have to share anything publicly, but I do love seeing it. Uh, it's inspiring to me. And, you know, it's not all wins, is it? Um, some frustrations, some roadblocks, and that's what I'm here for. Um, Keep in mind that you've only had this piece uh, 72 hours or less, you know, if you've been following the same schedule. Um, and that being the case, before you need to make your final recording, you're going to have it for another 72 hours. So you're really only halfway there. I know, you know, we've got five days of the live training, but then you've got, if you're doing this uh, live with me, you've got the whole weekend, which is two more days to finish your performance video. So really we're only at the halfway point now so i do want you to keep that in mind particularly if you've been looking at some new techniques um if double stops are new to you rapid string crossings uh bowing patterns i mean the, the whole concept of hand frame i mean these are all great and worthy concepts uh they're going to help you for the long term as well as immediately in this violinic theme but you've got time you know, you've got time the rest of this week, and you've got your whole violin life, you got this whole summer, uh, to put these into practice. So I'm here to help with them in the short term, and, you know, we'll talk a little bit later how we can work more on them in the long term. But um, just don't be dismayed 
if some new stuff isn't gelling quite yet. That's my big message to you. And today, we really don't have that much um, more uh, in terms of new techniques to look at. We're going to look at downward shifting because I got a great request for that. Um, and we're going to look at octaves and fingered octaves just briefly. And then we're going to talk practice strategies, um, how to put all this together. And then tomorrow, we'll be focused only on that. So let's take a look at downward shifting. Um, I did not give you an assignment on that. Um, but if it's something that's bedeviling you a little bit, let's try to make it a little bit easier. Uh, if you look at this famous uh, place between rehearsal C and D, um, I went ahead and talked about two ascending shifts there. Um, but I didn't talk about the downward shifts, and often those are <laughs> a little uh, trickier. So now both of these downward shifts are on bow changes, and so you have the luxury of doing the shift in a bow change. So we're going to talk about the concept of the guide finger, right? Almost all downward shifts are old finger shifts. Not, not all but most of them are, and uh, I would treat these as old finger shifts. So this guide finger, you're on a second finger, you're going to be shifting down to one, so you need to know where your second finger is going to go. So that's one choice, and that's probably the choice I would take, shifting down to a C, in other words, second position for the second finger. And that's going to happen, so it's old finger, old bow. Now the only other thing you have to do, right now your first and second finger have a half step relationship. Here, they're going to have a whole step relationship. Now you could just, you could use a C flat or a, you know call it a B natural as your guide note. Um, I tend to prefer guide notes that are in the key and the tonality that I'm, that I'm in. That's just me. You do whatever works for you. I'm going to use that C as my guide note. So I just have to put my one and two in a whole step spacing by the end of that shift. Now, you're hearing a lot of the slide. You're hearing the guide note. How do we get from that to... Um, well, there were two different choices of B flat there. Um, sticky fingerboard, me and my excuses. Um, just as in the ascending shifts, the more you want to hear a shift, the earlier and the slower you do it, the less you want to hear it. And in fact, this one I really don't want to hear at all. I'm going to do it later and faster. So to go from here, later and faster. even later, even faster. And if you want to get really good at this, of course, you put on that metronome so that you get the click, 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 so that you're always changing bow right on the click. <laughs> Putting it late enough, it's almost sounding like a performance shift now. Keep in mind, I'm not stopping the bow at all. I'm keeping the bow as smooth as possible, trying to get all of this timing with the left hand only. And if at the very end I need to stop the bow, put a tiny space, that's my last resort. I would only do that if I simply can't uh, time it any better. But in this case, I think we can time it just fine so that the listeners won't hear it. Yeah. Of course, I don't mind hearing that one. I love it. <laughs> This is the exact same concept. Uh, we're just starting up in fifth position rather than fourth position. <laughs> Happens to be the same guide note. Yep, so. 
here, this is kind of a natural phrase ending, isn't it? So in this case, I think it's perfectly fine to put a little bit more of a space with the bow. The other one was right in the middle. I didn't want to put a space there, right? If I did it with some other fingering. I'd like to connect that as much, pos as, much as possible. But this, here's where the new phrase begins. Okay, so. I could connect it if I wanted. With that same question of timing. Um, so, I'm just going to check in and <laughs> see if the Facebook stream is actually working here. I just got curious. But if not, of course, it's on YouTube. So, um, good. It looks like we may be back on Facebook. Could be too late for, for some of you, but um, internet stuff, who knew? Um, so let's go right from that to the octaves. And that's actually the one assignment that you have um, for day four, the one specific assignment. Your other assignments will depend on your particular strengths and weaknesses. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about so-called regular octaves, one, four octaves, because that's really the more important technique. Um, your skill with fingered octaves is going to come from your skill with the regular 1-4 octaves. And uh, boy, there have been times where most of what I practiced in a whole week were 1-4 um, octaves, thirds, and trills. Between those three things, I can get my left hand in about as good shape as I need it to be. It's all hand frame stuff. Um, and why? A 1-4 octave really defines the hand frame, right? So if you can get good and confident at being able to play a 1-4 octave anywhere on the fingerboard, or even if you just start working in that direction, you can therefore be confident that your frame is going to be strong everywhere. So let's, instead of playing this passage right away, let's do just a little bit of a scale, an E-flat major scale in octaves. In fact, I'm going to slur it at first. Now, I don't want to hide any of the space in between the octaves. You can tell from uh, these last few days that I'm a big fan of hearing shifts, hearing slides, and then hearing less of them later if I, if I would rather not. But let's just take that as an example, and maybe I would do the same thing up one string. First of all, the same principles that we talked about um, with double stops apply here as far as fixing the pitch, right? Temptation is just to, uh, I can't get away from that fast enough. But instead, OK, so the A string is low, lift and replace. strings now a little high, lift and replace, and then I can lift both and reform the frame, reform the octave. It's by doing that repeatedly, repeatedly in a single practice session, but especially repeatedly over the course of days, or a week in this case, that you really start to get that comfort with the octaves. So again, don't obsess about, you know, I say play a scale in octaves. Start with <laughs> connecting two notes. If you can do that beautifully, that's the basis for your scale. I'm not concerned with whether or not you can whip off a whole octave or two octave scale in octaves. You know, it's about getting one octave nicely. By the way, when you do that, yes, it's great if you can have a nice curve to the fourth finger. That makes it possible to be more, more supple. Uh, to perhaps even to vibrate in the octaves. Um, if you need extra help with that pinky, remember I've got that YouTube video on pinky power that will help you build that curve um, to your finger if you've never had it before, maybe get it back 
I found when I was 25 that my fourth finger was collapsing and straightening all of a sudden and I had to build that back. Well, that video shows how I did it. So you start with the fourth finger, reach back for the one, yeah? You don't want to be playing one nice and comfy but then reaching up for four. That's a recipe for a stiff hand, right? So I'm gonna start here, reach back for the one. So I slide up to the next note. Now, as I said, the space between the notes just as important as the so-called destinations, the, the, the checkpoints, the notes of the scale. I want every part of the slide to be an in-tune octave. So, you know, I got this note, but the space in between, I kind of went out of octave, didn't I? Sort of sounded... So, if I start to hear that... Hmm. Ah, my fourth finger is low. That means my fourth finger wasn't moving as fast as the one. Let me try leading with the four. Much better. Ah, this time the one is low. The one was not moving as fast. Let me back up. Lead with the one. and so on, note by note. Um, quit while you're ahead, you know? Take those small successes. If you can get from one note to the next beautifully, take that as a win. And, you know, do two minutes at a time. Come back to it later, rather than saying, I'm gonna take these 10 minutes and master this octave scale. It's just not the way it works. It's like trying to cram for a test, you know? And I know we're doing a compressed schedule here on purpose, but just dip in and dip out. Keep switching up the things you're working on. All of these things will come together in your hands. Um, could be on the schedule you want, could be a little slower, but you're building these great habits for the long term and they will help you in this piece too. Now the fingered octaves. The way I work on fingered octaves is to practice the same thing, all with one three. Remember, I'm gonna start with the third finger, reach back. Now this may be easier for my hand than it is for yours. Could be hand size, could be inherent flexibility. Most likely, it's a, a dash of those things and a whole lot of practicing doing it. Um, and the same can be true for you. But as I said, the one four octaves are by far more important. So make sure that you're comfortable in those before you bother doing this. Of course, back down, same for one four octaves. I wanna be good at going down as well. And then I would do all of them with two four. And a dirty little secret, my four sometimes likes to straighten when I do those. I'm okay with that. Um, I haven't found it completely necessary to do a whole scale's worth of two four octaves and vibrate all of them. Um, I'm just, I'm okay with my four straightening in that situation. So when you see it happen, just know that I know the two. Um, and it, were I by myself instead of in front of you, I would have repeated that one that was not in tune. I would have lifted, replaced, and probably repeated seven, eight times till I got bored. Um, once I'm comfortable with the, all the one threes and all the two fours, then it's not that big a deal to alternate them. And so those of you who have played or tried fingered octaves before, try this technique, um, getting comfortable 
with all one threes, all two fours, and then... That then gets a lot easier. So uh, the fingerings that I put in from D to E are the ones that I like if you're doing fingered octaves. Right there. I don't consider that a shift because I really don't want my hand to move. I want that to be strictly the fingers going, dipping back a half step and back. So in two entire measures, I haven't shifted. This is a little ticky-tack shift. A reach, followed by a shift. Downward shift, the same as we were doing before. Yeah. I don't mind hearing that slide at all. Or this. Drag the fingers back. Yep, so. And in the end, remember what Heifetz said, you should always play octaves a little bit out of tune so that people know you're playing octaves. I, I always love that. Um, I really wish I could have met him. <laughs> um, good. Well, that is all. Congratulations. That's all the techniques in the piece. Um, and again, the more of these techniques that are new for you, the more it's going to seem overwhelming. But that's precisely why I suggested these modifications. You know, none of that is a cop-out. <laughs> you know, none of that is making it easy. Uh, a lot of things about the violin, I think, should be easier than they are. But hey, playing beautifully on the violin is not easy. If it were, then everybody would be great at it. So the fact that you really want to put in this time and refine all of this, you know, Congratulations, most people are not willing to do that. Uh, it doesn't interest them. So I want to hang out with people uh, for whom that is interesting, fascinating, perhaps even an obsession. And that's why by the end of today, I want you to have stopped uh, going back and forth about different sections of the piece. I want you to have decided what version you're going to record so that starting tomorrow, you wake up, refreshed and you know exactly what your task is going to be. That way tomorrow when we talk strategy you can apply it to exactly what you know you're going to do. Are you going to play any, you know, the section from B to C? Are you going to play any of those double stops? Or are you going to skip it for now? Because either one is totally fine. Uh, C to D, are you going to play that on the G string or the C string for viola? Or are you going to use a different fingering and make that beautiful and expressive? D to E, Remember, you've got options. You can play the fingered octaves. You can play all one four octaves, which is such great practice and perhaps even more expressive, right? There's something nice about that slide as opposed to, I mean, that's easier to get around, but You know, that's a fingering I would have to practice, but there's something about the expression that I quite like, too. Um, or you could play no octaves at all. You pick either octave by itself. So, you know, you first you play this kind of sound, and then... Different register, different kind of sound, or... 
you've got options. E to F, and um, excuse me, sorry, F to G, of course, with the all that stuff. I had my written suggestion for you too. So by the end of today, um, so tomorrow's mostly the strategy session. Let's look at that today as well. Um, and as I say in the assignments, it's going to depend on what your strengths and weaknesses are. Tomorrow we're going to talk a lot about testing the different sections, uh, by which I mean the different rehearsal letters, basically. You know, which are the ones, if I walked into your practice room or someone else, friend or colleague, walked into the practice room and said, play letter, whatever, which ones would you say, okay, yeah, here it is, or ah, not D, or you know, not G, or um, those are the ones <laughs> that you want to start with. Um, and if you don't know, then just start from the beginning. You know, that's <laughs> that's what most of us grew up doing, right? Practicing meant just starting at the beginning and, and playing <laughs> and fixing stuff when we messed up. I'd like to get us away from that a little, but. <laughs> So if you get here, and then this wants to be an issue, uneven, or you can't find the contact point or something, then you've got uh, strategies for that, right? You've got assignments. Those weren't necessarily just for that day. I know some of you have kept um, repeating assignments from day one on days two and three as well. Uh, that wasn't required, but you know, starting today on day four, day five, you're going to have to get creative ones that are still a little bit of an issue for you, just repeat those assignments. Okay, so the... And the... For these string crossings. got your um, arm level and off string strategies to deal with that. Um, here concepts of generous bow as well as the martile, the finger articulation, even the popcorn game if that was fun for you. And then fingers in advance Fingers a step ahead, arm levels a step ahead. Um, one thing I don't think I mentioned about here is um, coming off the lower notes. So I don't hold them strictly all the way as it looks on the page. Um, we could call that wrong notation or we could just uh, I took my inspiration from Bach because a lot of times as it's written in Bach looks like maybe you hold two or three voices the whole time but you can make creative choices I kind of wanted the accompaniment to sound like rather than so Same there, rather than... Finger prep and arm prep, so important for double stops. C to D, we went over uh, nicely today. Same with D to E. Now, everything from E to G, again, with that, that concept of being the detective putting on the Sherlock Holmes cap. Um, I don't smoke a pipe, but you know, maybe some of you do. Um, just make it really simple. Any issues you're having, are they more due to the left hand or the right hand? Sometimes it can be hard to tell, but left hand issues, you know, intonation, that's always easy to hear. What might not be as easy to hear is if something sounds messy, is it because of a string crossing or a shift timing for 
were perhaps not getting fingers over soon enough. See there, it's possible. That sounds messy, right? A bad sound. The first thought, of course, naturally would probably be the bow. But, hmm, you know, the bow seems fine. It's actually the finger, not down all the way. So I didn't get it over early enough and down soon enough. Here, I have to figure out if this is string crossing stuff or shift timing. Uh, that shift was late, right? Needs to happen before the bow change. So with all of this, I would really encourage you to listen for one thing at a time, to fix one thing at a time, and then to release yourself from the expectation that that thing is going to be fixed forever and ever. It is normal for it to go back the way it was when you come back to it a minute later. It doesn't mean you did anything wrong in your working on it, in your fixing of it. It's just the nature of habits, right? You were playing it a certain way. You've asked yourself to make a change. You made that change. You come back a minute later. The habits are still strong. You do it the old way. That's normal and that's part of the process. And it's exactly why you don't want to fix 12 things at once, come back expecting them all to be fixed, and then to beat yourself up when they're not. Instead, you listen for and fix one thing at a time, and then you move on. You come back to that passage in another practice session or on another practice day. I know we don't have too many of those right here, but um, you allow for the fact that you need repeated exposure to these things for them to happen in the new way. So change the rules. Do whatever you need to do to hear and feel success in the new way. If that feels good and sounds good, repeat it that way. I know it's really slow. Um, if it's feeling really great and you want to play it faster, do that. But if it's not happening right away, don't try it out seven or eight more times and fail every one of those eight times. You know, play it a couple times to see how it feels and then figure out what the issue is. You know, is it just a string crossing and then everything after the string crossing is fine? Play all the stuff after the string crossing. At least get used to that timing. And then look at the string crossing without insisting on going on. That's an arm timing thing, yeah? Again, after the string crossing. Maybe add one or two notes. But the biggest mistake is to expect, well, I've done, you know, before, I've done after, now I'm going to mush them together and it should be just fine. It might be, and it's great if it is. But if it isn't, um, that's more what I would expect. Give it a little time. Same with these shifts. If you can time them great at a slower tempo and the timing is a little difficult at the faster tempo, don't try to play the whole passage to test it out. A few notes is enough. Yeah. So that's the message I would leave you with today encouragement you're sticking in this sorry sticking with this hanging in there and you're really only at the halfway point so find the techniques that are new to you and by the end of today make a decision on those are they ones that you're excited about you know working with some more over the next couple days and putting into your version of the piece or do you get the sense that for the moment it's going to be too much and it's going to make this whole experience stressful because that's not what I want it to be. As I said in the beginning, I want you to reach a little this week. I want you to learn new ways of practicing um, and to gain confidence in um, some new things. But I don't want you to feel overwhelmed or super stressed. 
So any of those techniques that just feel like, yeah, this is ruining it for me, <laughs> ditch them by the end of today and make your version of the Violympic theme something that you can look forward to playing a lot more over the next few days. When I say a lot more, really not talking that much time, right? I'm hoping that all of the assignments so far you've been able to get done in maybe half an hour and then add your own embellishments as you like. So tonight, it's octaves. Do some octave scale stuff, whether or not you're going to put it in this piece. Um, by the end of today, decide on your final performance version of the Violimbic theme, and then spend more time on the sections that are giving you more trouble, but don't obsess on any one of them. Don't let any one section ruin your time playing this piece. And then we will come back tomorrow with some great strategies as far as transitions, keywords and thoughts, um, how to test and for how long. It's going to be fun and hopefully some strategies that you haven't used before. So thanks uh, those of you who tried on Facebook and had the difficulty. Thanks for hanging in there. I know it eventually came back for many of you. And um, on YouTube, I think YouTube was uh, super solid the whole way. So that's why I <laughs> have the backups. <laughs> All right. Um, can't wait to see you again tomorrow. Uh, day five of five. Still not too late to join. If you're watching this and you're not uh, registered yet, register so you get the music. And uh, you can start today as day one. All right. See you soon.